In this video, we're going to cover PS2 emulation setup using Aether SX2. We are back with another PCSX2 setup vid, only this time it is under the branding of Aether SX2. Some stuff has happened in the scene, and the standalone UWP app for PCSX2 has been picked up by Aether SX2 team, who will be building upon it and distributing it from here on out. But as such, a number of features have already been added in that were missing out of the last little beta build and is just so much better. So let's go ahead and dive in. Now before we begin, this is a dev mode tutorial, so if you do not have dev mode set up on your Xbox, you can refer to my RetroArch install guide for how to get dev mode installed and activated onto your box, so then you can continue along with this guide. So follow the steps to get dev mode, and then move on from there. So to get started with this process, you do need to have an Xbox Series X or S. I don't recommend doing this on an Xbox One due to its crappy CPU. Technically, yes, you can run it, but don't expect good performance out of an overwhelming majority of games. And for this tutorial, we are going to be focusing on a USB install. So if you want to do an SSD internal install, you can still do that. I'm just not going over those steps completely here. If you're familiar with how to do things through the internal SSD, go for it. But for this tutorial, we're sticking with USB because it's easier to update the program version without having to back everything up first, and it's just a lot better. Then you're going to need to source some PS2 games, and these could be an either ISO, BinQ, GZIP, CHUD, doesn't really matter. So for mine, I have them all in CHUD format, except for Half-Life, which is still in a BIN format because it was a CD-based game, I didn't feel like compressing it. But any PS2 format should be fine here. If you have a large physical collection of PS2 games, I do have a video on how to back those up on my channel, so you can find that in the description below for a link to this video. Next, you will also need a PS2 BIOS. This can be in either multi-file format if you use the PCSX2 BIOS dumper, or it could be in a single format file. Doesn't matter which, just you have to have a PS2 BIOS. So over on my channel, I once again have guides on how to dump your PS2 BIOS either from a FAT or from a slim. Slim is a lot easier, despite the longer video length. This is a much easier process, but videos are there for you if you need them. Or, you know, if you want to get your games and BIOSes through the shady parts of the net, feel free to. I don't really care, but don't ask me for illegal download links because I will not provide them on my channel because it's illegal. But anyway. And finally, we need to get the Aether SX2 UWP app. Link to this site will be in the description below. So you can scroll down and you will see a number of different files. So there are two versions of PCSX2, Aether SX2 available. There's the SSE4 version and the AVX2 version. On Xbox Series X and S, we want the AVX2 version. They included the SSE4 version for Xbox One users. So if you're on Xbox One, grab SSE4. But again, I wouldn't really waste my time with it. For us, on Xbox Series X and S, we want the AVX2 version. So just grab the latest version that is available. They have multiple versions available, so you can see there's 239 here or 240 in this demo video. I don't know what they'll be at when you are running through this tutorial, so just grab the latest one available. You can see that they are organized by date, version number, so just grab the newest one. And with all of that in place, we are ready to begin getting things set up for Aether SX2 PS2 emulation. So get your USB drive of any variety, hard drive, SSD, flash drive, SD card, get that plugged into your computer and open it up. Now once your USB drive is in place, we need to set up some security permissions on it and this is only available through Windows. Really essential if you want to get the best performance out of your USB drive, especially for RetroArch. I don't know if Aether SX2 needs it as much, but for RetroArch it is a necessity. So we're just going to kick it back to old me to show us that step process. After you have your USB drive placed in your Windows PC, right click on it within this PC. Properties. We're looking for the security tab up here. Advanced. Now we're going to go and click on add. Select a principle. Advanced. Find now. And we are looking for the one that says all application packages. And once you have that selected, just press OK. And then press OK again. And now we are going to click on the full control box here. Once that's set, press OK. 
and we're going to click this box here that says replace all child object permission entries with inheritable permission entries from this object. Once that's done, press OK. It's going to say, hey, we're going to change some stuff on your drive. Do you wish to continue? We're going to say yes. And you might get an error on certain files within your drive. Just press continue on them. And once it's done, it'll just bring you back to your properties and you can just see that they have now added all application packages. It's set to full control and we can press OK. All right. Thank you, old me. Now with those security permissions out of the way. If you followed any of my RetroArch setup guides, chances are you might have a RetroArch folder structure inside your USB drive ready to go. And if you do, that's awesome because you'll have your PS2 games already on it. You'll have your PS2 BIOS already in it and you can just reuse those inside Aether SX2. You don't need to copy them over again. And then you could also have your PS2 memory cards. So if you have this folder structure already in place, awesome, you don't need to do anything else. But if you're doing this for the first time, you haven't done anything on RetroArch or anything, just copy your PS2 BIOS folder, your PS2 games, right over into your USB drive and wait for it to do its thing. Now, if you also happen to have PS2 saves that you wish to copy onto your USB drive, you can do so now. So I have a couple from my PC version of PCSX2 here. So I'm just gonna copy them over here. Or if you have PS2 saves already in your uh, RetroArch folder, you can uh, just grab those PS2 memory card files, move them out to this folder if you want to. You can leave them in here, doesn't really matter. But you have the option of adding PS2 saves to your USB drive because we can redirect the save folder here momentarily. But once you have those security permissions set and your files copied over, we are ready to move on to installing Aether SX2. So once again, this is a dev mode setup guide. We have our UWP package for Aether SX2. So we're just going to move over to the Xbox here real quick. So over on your Xbox, get it booted up into dev mode and you should see a remote access portal on the right hand side. Inside of that, you will see a tab here that says require authentication. Make sure that's checkmarked and then set a username and password. And also make sure the enable Xbox device portal thing is activated. But now make note of that remote access IP address that it is giving you right there inside that box. That is what we are going to be typing into a web browser to install Aether SX2. So back over on my computer, I opened up uh, my Edge browser, typed it in, and it's telling me that my connection isn't private. So I'm just going to click on advance and tell it to continue anyway. And then it will ask you for your username and password. And once you put them in, you should be greeted with the Xbox device portal. Now from here, we're going to click on add. Navigate to where you have your Aether SX2 UWP package, double click it, or you could just drag it into the box here, doesn't matter. Then just click on next. There's no dependencies for this one, so just click on start and wait for the installation process to finish. All set. Now from here, we're ready to move over to the Xbox and get everything set up and ready to run. So back over on the Xbox, get your USB drive plugged into the Xbox. And if this is your first time doing so, you'll get a pop-up message saying, if you want to format it as Xbox storage or media storage, choose media. Otherwise, you will delete everything you just put on it. But there we go. Now, we're going to need to do one more thing with Aether SX2 here before we can actually begin enjoying it. So, select it, press the back button on your controller, go down to view details, and change it from an app to a game. And you should be all set from there, but I always like to restart my console after doing so. I don't know how necessary it is, but it gives me peace of mind, so I don't care. But now we're ready to begin enjoying Aether SX2, so head on down to it and press A. You might get a prompt to sign in. So just sign into the account you bought, with de uh, you bought dev mode with. And then just press A on it again to get loaded up. And you'll get this message saying settings were reset. That's fine. We just installed it. There are no settings. Cool deal. Now we just need to get some things set up here. So head down to settings and press your right bumper. And you'll see that there is the game list settings here. And we are going to choose a new directory to search for games. We do not want to be using the Q drive, especially for PS2 games, because once you hit that 30 gig limit, nothing will work. So that's why we're using USB. Or alternatively, you could just put stuff in the S drive if you expanded your dev mode storage. But again, we're not going into that in this tutorial. But add search directory, 
click on parent directory until you get to the top of your uh, folder structure here and navigate down to E. This will be your USB drive. And if you put your PS2 games just in the root like this, you could just tell it to scan this directory. And it will scan your games and add them to your game list. Or if you have your games in your RetroArch games folder or wherever you might also have them, just navigate to those. So again, if you already have a PS2 games folder, just navigate to it and tell it to use that directory. Now with that game directory set, we need to set a BIOS directory. So press right bumper one more time and that brings us to our BIOS settings. So now we can change the search directory for this as well. Same thing, parent directory. And for USB drive, we go down to E, you could go to PS2 BIOS, tell it to use this directory. Or if you have a RetroArch folder set up, you can go into System, PCSX2, BIOS, use this directory. But once you have the directory set, you could go down to BIOS selection and you could choose between all the various PS2 BIOS files that you might have. So I have one from my fat and one from my slim. So I'm just gonna choose my fat. But then we can confirm that the BIOS has uh, been chosen correctly by going to start BIOS. And if it loads up into the PS2 BIOS, hey, we're golden. But there's one more step we could do in here that is useful. So if you didn't copy any PS2 memory cards over to your USB drive or from RetroArch or wherever, you could go into the browser and you could format your memory cards. You could do this in any game as well, but I just like doing it here just to make sure they're ready. And then you could just press uh, right and left bumper to bring up your quick menu. We're going to change this hotkey later, don't worry. And you can close out of the BIOS. But if you want to change your memory card settings or save locations, you could just press the right bumper to go over to memory card settings here. And you'll see the memory card directory folder here. So we could just press A on this, parent directory, choose a new directory for it. So I'm going to put this into my PS2 memory card save, just like that. And then you could eject the old cards. Enable, disable, enable, disable, enable. And then you can choose the uh, memory cards that you're going to use for each slot. Just like that. But you can also create new memory cards at any time. And it's just really handy. But now when I go in to start the BIOS. Head into the browser. I now have save files on this memory card ready to go. So as you can see, it is now pulling them from my USB drive. But let's head back into settings here real quick. And one of the new additions is the controller settings menu is now populated. So this is awesome. We now have multi-tap support. We can choose uh, different key bindings. And we can enable controller port two with a DualShock. You will need to have another controller plugged in for it to work, obviously, but the option is right in here and it makes it nice and convenient. But anyway, hotkey settings. Not sure why it was all the way down there, but scroll up to the top. You'll see open pause menu is set to left shoulder, right shoulder. A lot of you have discovered this is a really bad hotkey, so you could press A on this to change it to something more effective like start and back. And with that set, we are ready to launch into PS2 games. So go down to open game list, and then you can just choose a game and tell it to run. So today we're going to just load up some uh, Freedom Fighters. And just like that, you are now able to enjoy the vast, overwhelming majority of the PS2 library and relive the early 2000s. And at any time during gameplay, you could press the hotkey you set up to get back into your quick menu to get in and exit out of the game, and it'll ask if you want to save your state or not. You can choose whichever one you want. But the time has come to go over some more settings available to us within Aether SX2. So going into the settings menu, our first tab here is interface settings. You really don't need to mess with anything on this one. You could turn off or on show messages if you want to. It just has a little notification in the top left corner when like your PS2 memory card's written to. Then you could also show like the current speed of your emulation, FPS, CPU usage, GPU usage, 
resolution, statistics, and these are all great indicators of seeing how well your PS2 emulation is running. And you can then decide if you want to upscale further, pull, pull it back if it's being uh, taxed a little too much. So it can be pretty useful. But for me, I like turning off show messages. I don't really need it. Next, game list settings. We already went over this one. BIOS settings. We already went over that one. But one option that you can do is disable fast boot if you want to have the PS2 BIOS intro play every time you start up a PS2 game. If you do disable this, you will need to have region variant BIOS files if you're using multi-region games. Otherwise, leave it on. You don't have to worry about region checks. Next up, emulation settings. So from here, you can set the normal speed your PS2 emulation runs at, the fast forward speed, slow motion speed, and enable a speed limiter, or disable it rather. You want to kind of leave this on, otherwise your games will run too fast. Next up, maximum frame latency. This is set to two frames automatically. Feels fine there. But if you want to have the lowest latency possible, you could turn on optimal frame pacing, which then hard sets it to zero frames. I haven't had time to go through and check how this performs on the Xbox Series S or X, so you could try it out. If you get lag, you can disable it again. Next, adjust to host refresh rate. This affects emulation speed to match it to your monitor's refresh rate. Not really needed too much in most cases, but if you have a lot of screen tearing or something, you could try enabling it. Next up, cheats, widescreen patches, and no interlacing patches. Let's go ahead and go over those real quick. So to use cheats, widescreen patches, no interlace patches, and by extension HD texture packs, we need to install an FTP browser onto our Xbox. So Durango FTP, for example. So I will have a download link to Durango in the description below. Install it just like you did with Aether SX2, except this time you will need the dependency files included. So make sure you get all three of those added to the list. And then make sure that Durango is set to a game as well, otherwise you might get an empty file system. But once you have Durango installed, just go ahead and open it up. Make sure Allow Anonymous is ticked, port 21, it should all be set by default. And then just click on Start. And then over on the right, you will see addresses of this device. Those are the FTP addresses you can type into your FTP program or Windows File Explorer to access your Xbox. So once again, make note of those. So back over on the computer, I'm going to open up my File Explorer. I like using this over an FTP program personally. You can do whatever works best for you. But I'm just going to FTP over into my Xbox. So FTP and then the IP address of my Xbox. And there we go. It brings me into my Xbox's file structure. So the two folders that we're gonna be interested in most are the S drive and the local folder. So I'm gonna open up the local folder and you'll see that there is an Aether SX2 folder in here. So opening this up, go into local state and you'll see a number of different uh, folders in here. So, I mean, if you wanted to install things internally, you could have put your BIOS file in here, put games in here, but once you get that 30 gig limit again, you're going to run out of space, so I don't recommend it. But, mem cards are stored here by default. So, just a little demo of where things would be default if we weren't using USB. But, anyway, you'll notice there's a cheats WS folder and a cheats NI folder and just a cheats folder. This is where all of our cheats are going to go that we're going to make use of. So if you want to use the widescreen and no interlace patches, they're already included in Aether SX2. You just have to pull them out. So those are in the S drive, program files, Windows apps. Find your Aether SX2 folder, resources, and you'll see cheats and I and cheats ws.zip. So copy all of the so copy both of those over to your computer and then get them extracted. And now we can go back over into our local folder, Aether SX2, local state, and we're going to start with the widescreen sheets here. So open up my widescreen sheets folder here. And there are so many of these that it will take a while, so just uh, bear with it while they copy over. And once that copying is finished, we can just close out of that folder. Back out, back into our local state folder, find the cheats ni folder, and then do the same thing of copying all of these files over into our Xbox. 
and then just be patient with it while it does its thing again. And then when that one's done, close out of that folder, go back into the local state folder. And then for any cheats files you might have, they'll just go straight into the cheats folder right here. I don't have any to demo today, but this is where they would end up. But once you have those cheat files in place, you could just go back into Aether SX2, head down into settings, go back into emulation settings, and then you can enable cheats, widescreen patches, no interlacing patches. I'm gonna turn cheats off since I don't have any in there. But now when I go to open up a game, a little base combat five here. If you have messages enabled, it'll show you in the top left that cheats, widescreen cheats, and no interlacing cheats were applied. But unfortunately, as you can see there, not every game is compatible with widescreen hacks and deinterlacing hacks. So you will need to go through your games and see if they work with said cheats. So just as another example here, if I turn those back off and load up Ace Combat 5, you can see that the game is behaving as intended. It lets us get in and start a new game up and play it normally. But now for an example of a game that does work with widescreen codes, we have Xena Saga here. So I have the codes enabled and as you can see, the characters are looking kinda twiggy. So we can fix this by going into the settings Go into the graphics settings and we could change the aspect ratio to 16 by 9. And there we go, now the characters are looking a bit more normalized. Alright, back to settings. So our next option is enable per game settings. We want to leave this on because we can make per game setting files for each game. So ones that don't work with widescreen codes or something, we can disable those for those games and enable them for others. But right bumper, system settings. I like how it always starts at the bottom. So, for the most part, you're not going to be changing anything in here. You just want to leave all of this stuff at default for the best possible performance. But at times, a game might need a special setting set in here, and you can refer to the PCSX2 wiki for anything that might be the case. Right, bumper, graphic settings. So, first up, renderer. It uses the Direct3D12 renderer by default, but you can change between that, Direct3D11, and software mode. A lot of games need software mode for all their graphical effects to work, so... It's great to see it working here. Now, I want to take a minute here to talk about the importance of the software renderer. So right now I'm running Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence in just the normal hardware renderer upscaled to 1440p. But as you can see, the ground textures and shadowing are completely wrong. So if I go into the quick menu here and switch it over to the software renderer, there we go. So unfortunately, it brings it back down to native PS2 resolution, but the game looks like it's supposed to. So there are a number of games that have broken graphical effects until you switch to the software mode. And thankfully, the Series X and S are pretty powerful machines and are capable of running a lot of games purely in software mode. But at any point, you could also switch back to the hardware renderer with this handy-dandy hotkey being here. And I keep going into my radio. But there we go. So once again, broken shadows and effects. So again, you will need to refer to the PCSX2 wiki for which games are better off in software mode versus hardware mode. Or, you know, just learn to deal with a few uh, problematic graphics. Then you get to turn on V-Sync if you wish. Aspect ratio. Set this to stretch. 4x3, 16x9, or auto 4x3. Same with the FMV ratios. Deinterlacing, you could choose your preferred deinterlacing method. Automatic is good. Zoom, vertical stretch, bilinear upscaling, integer upscaling. So integer upscaling is nice because it will result in a sharper image, but can result in black borders around your screen depending on the game. So personal preference on that one. Internal resolution screenshots. If you take a lot of screenshots, you can have them be at internal res or upscaled. Screen offsets. And then internal resolution, you could bump this up to full 4K for almost everything and be perfectly fine. If you start getting lag where you didn't have it before, you could bring it back down. Me, personally, I leave it at about 1440p for best possible performance without having to worry about it. Mitmapping, we could leave this on automatic. 
or you could go for full PS2 bitmaps. It can cause performance issues in some games, so just be aware of that. Bilinear filtering, trilinear filtering, anisotropic filtering, you shouldn't have any issues enabling this. Dithering, you can leave this in unscaled or you can have it scaled. CRC fixed level, you could just leave this on automatic. Blending accuracy, you could leave this on basic. Texture preloading, this is set to full by default. Hardware download mode, just leave that on accurate. And then we're going to skip over the next few steps here because we're just going to leave them at default and head down to manual hardware fixes. So as you can see, it jumps from manual hardware fixes down to texture replacements, but then when we enable it, we get a lot more things we can mess with here. And a lot of these are going to be very game specific, like the skip draw stuff, half pixel offset, round sprites. So you will be able to check the PCSX2 wiki for anything that you might need to change in here for different games that require it. Again, link to that will be in the description below. But all right, texture replacements. So load custom textures. Let's go over this real quick. So first of all, you want to turn load textures on, turn on asynchronous texture loading and pre-cache replacements. But now let's go over how to get those actually installed onto your Xbox. So for this, you're going to once again need to go into Durango and start your FTP file share. Now over on your computer, you're going to need to navigate into your Xbox's FTP file share, the local folder, AetherSX2 folder, local state folder, and there you will see a textures folder. So from here, download any HD texture pack that you want. So for my example here, I have Xenosaga 1's HD UI work in progress texture pack and inside that is a folder with the game code so just copy that folder into the textures folder and there we go that texture pack is now ready to be used so now back over on the xbox going back into aether sx2 and make sure hd texture packs was on real quick all right good still on and for this to really work, you need to, of course, have uh, upscaling enabled. Otherwise, you won't be able to tell too much of a difference. And then I have widescreen codes enabled, so I'm going to just change this back to 16 by 9 real quick. But now I'm just going to load into Xenosaga Episode 1. And from here, if I go into my menu, you can see that character portraits and text are a lot sharper than they normally would be without this texture pack. So, for example, here's what it would look like without the texture pack. A nice difference. But then you could also dump textures if you want to make your own HD texture packs. And next we have a couple of advanced options within the graphics settings. A lot of these you don't really need to mess with, but you can check in the PCSX2 wiki if any are required. Otherwise, just leave them all alone. All right, next up, audio settings. This is a new menu tab with uh, the Aether SX2 update. So you can change uh, the sound formats, synchronization modes, output, output module. This is set to unknown. It seems to be working okay, but you can also choose X Audio 2 otherwise. Next is latency, but this only applies to the Cubib backend, so it's not useful for us, but you can also change some... Uh, time stretch settings here as well for all of those of you that are really into audio settings. All right, next up, memory card settings. We kind of went over this already. And then controller settings. You can enable a multi-tap on the different controller ports. So we are finally able to take advantage of more than two player support on PS2 games on Xbox. As you can see, there are multiple controllers listing now. Then hotkey settings once again, so you can set different things like cycle aspect ratio if you have games that are widescreen versus not. Just a ton here. You go through them, set them as needed. This build doesn't have retro achievement support currently. And then finally we have the advanced setting, but you're not really going to need to mess with anything in here, so just uh, don't worry about it. And now just a quick demonstration here of swapping discs on Aether SX2. So I have disc 2 of Xenosaga Episode 2 inserted. I told it to start a new game. It's asking me to insert disc 1. So I'm going to go into my quick menu. Change discs. And I'm going to choose 
Xena Saga Episode 2, Disc 1. And it will check the disc and load up as intended upon the swap. And there we go, new game started. Now the last thing I want to cover in this video specifically is how to make per game INI files. And the easiest way for me to make these personally, and what I think a lot of you will appreciate, is to actually use the PC version of PCSX2 here. So if you head to the PCSX2 website, go to download, scroll down to the nightly builds here, and then just click on the Windows part here and download the latest QT version of PCSX2. This can also be done on Mac. Mac has the QT version as well, but unfortunately Linux still is using WX widgets, so it's not gonna be possible on Linux. But once you have PCSX2 downloaded, you could just get it extracted, open up the folder, and then launch into it. And now just add in the game directory for all of the PS2 games that you're using. So, I mean, you can plug your USB drive into your computer, select that directory, but I have mine just right here still. So I can just go to the desktop, add my PS2 games, and it will bring up all of the games that I have in that folder. And from here, I can begin going through and manually editing settings. So for example, Metal Gear Solid 3, I can go into properties, Emulation, we can enable the no interlacing patches, enable widescreen patches, cheats if you want to, but then we could go to graphics, renderer, we could set this to software mode automatically so it doesn't mess with anything else. Since we're using those widescreen codes, we can turn on widescreen, FMV, we could turn that to standard 4x3, and then once we're all set, we could just close out of it. And then we could do the same thing for other games as well. So for example, Xena Saga. I want the widescreen and no interlacing patches on that one. And then in graphics, we'll set that to 16 by 9. FMVs can be in 4 by 3. Then in advanced, I can turn on uh, load textures, pre-cache textures, async texture loading. That way I could turn off the global settings for those so it doesn't mess with other games, but it'll still be here for Xena Saga. And then I could close out of that. But then you could just go through and do that on a game by game basis for all of the games in your collection. And once again, you could just go through the PCSX2 wiki, find the game that you are trying to play, and change the settings to match what it needs. But once you have your game settings made, you can go into the folder where you have PCSX2 computer version installed, you'll see the game settings folder, and you'll have INIs made for the games that you have set them up for, so Metal Gear Solid and Xena Saga 1 here for me. So back over on the Xbox, just get Durango FTP started up again, and then on the computer, navigate back into your local folder, x 2 folder, local state folder, and find the corresponding game settings folder, and drag your new uh, game setting INIs right on in. And now when we go back over to the Xbox and launch into Aether SX2, let's mess with some settings here. Make sure that we have everything set the way we want it to. So for example, graphic settings, let's make sure that we have, um, all right, internal resolutions on. All right, good. Let's, uh, I'm going to turn off load textures because Xenosaga should still load them up automatically due to the INI. And then for the aspect ratio, I'm going to turn this back to 4x3. And now when I load up Metal Gear Solid, it should be in software mode. And sure enough, there it is in software mode as intended, while the global setting was set to 1440p resolution on DirectRD 12. And the same thing for Xena Saga. It is displaying in widescreen despite the global settings being set to 4x3 and HD texture packs are enabled. Now, of course, you can manually make these game INI files if you know what they need to be named, but again, I find the method of using a computer version of PCSX2 just far more convenient, and it gets everything set up exactly as you need it. And with that, you should be able to get an overwhelming majority of your PS2 games playing absolutely beautifully on your Xbox Series X and S, with full multiplayer support included. 
While Aether SX2 is still in early alpha beta format, it is running super well and just smokes what RetroArch is able to achieve on the same hardware. But that's going to do it for this video, so as always, thank you all so much for watching. Aether SX2 emulation, just awesome, once again. But at the end of the video here, I do have a couple of huge favors to ask of you. If you haven't done so already, please hit that like or dislike button, depending on how much you like this tutorial. And if you haven't already, hit that sub button notification bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Loads of content coming your way, and I'd love to have each and every one of you along for the ride. For anyone interested in helping support the channel further, you can also check out that join button out here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing this content to all of you. Big shout out to all of our current backers, y'all are amazing, thank you for being our champions and believing in what we do. But, until next time my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.